with World of Warcraft, we were really trying to look at other massively multiplayer online RPGs and try to identify what were the elements of those games that were fun. And as we went through it, we would find that people really enjoyed the aspects of being online with multitudes of other players, and they loved leveling up their character and working on their equipment and working on their skills. With World of Warcraft, we put in a great questing system, so right at the beginning of the game, you have objectives. You get pulled right into the world, you have quests filling up your quest log, so you always are doing something for the characters in the environment. Every time that you log into the game, you can accomplish something. Even though you might not achieve a new level that night of gameplay, you might finish one or two quests, or you might earn a new rank in a trade skill, or explore a new zone. And that was something that we really tried to hit on. That way you're not so focused on the experience bar the entire time you're playing. Your only goal in the game is not necessarily leveling up, but it's completing quests and visiting new areas, learning new skills, sort of always developing your character and oftentimes players find that they level up and they don't even realize that they're close to leveling. What you'll notice when you start playing World of Warcraft is the user interface is somewhat minimal. You don't really need a manual to play the game. You know, everything about the interface is really towards keeping you in the game. We really don't like to have to have players go to the manual or go to the website just to figure out how to play the game. The first time that you log in, it's very intuitive and easy to use, but as you become more advanced, you can really customize it to do some pretty powerful things and a lot of our more experienced players will be able to sort of customize for each of their characters and, and really get the interface exactly how they like it. The quest log is another example of our user interface where we always want to make sure that when you're on a quest you know what you're supposed to do next. Uh, a lot of games in the massively multiplayer genre kind of force you to keep notes or to try to keep track yourself of where you're supposed to go or who you've talked to. We expose all that in the quest log. So once again, players, as they're playing the game, can work on their quests and they can stay in the game the entire time they're playing. Originally when we started designing quests, we knew that we wanted it to be an integral part of the game. We wanted people in World of Warcraft to have a sense of direction and a sense of purpose right away. So we developed our quest system, which includes a quest log. The quest not only became this sense of fun, but as designers it allows us to be tour guides almost of the world of Warcraft. There's really no limit to what we can do with our quest systems. As players get to familiarize themselves with World of Warcraft more, they'll realize that quests are almost like the backbone of the game. They really direct the play experience. World of Warcraft is a class-based game. When you first create your character, you have to choose a class archetype that kind of determines the spells and abilities and to some extent the way that you'll play the game. When we approached our classes, we wanted to make sure that our classes felt very Warcraft. We would look at the previous Warcraft games, try to determine what are some of the classic things that people want to be able to create. You know, we looked at things like the Druid, very popular unit type in Warcraft 3, so we brought that over as a class. We looked at the Hunter, which has always been, while not itself a true unit in Warcraft 2 or 3, we've always had this concept of the orcs and the uh, trolls being hunters in the environment, and we brought in the Torrens in Warcraft 3, so the Hunter became a class. We also had the classical classes, like Warriors and Mages. When we started designing the spells and abilities for the classes, we really wanted to make sure that each class played as differently from another class as possible. While we looked at something like the mage was a fairly easy class to develop because we knew we wanted him to have kind of all the classical sort of spells like fireballs and frost bolts and the rest, once we start working on other spellcasters, we really had to stretch our imaginations a little more to, to really make them feel different than the mage. When we approached the druid, we wanted to give him nature spells, which are somewhat obvious when you look at Warcraft 3. In Warcraft 3, the druid is a shapeshifter, so we brought that element into the druid class, which really makes him play much different than druids in a lot of other games. Our druid can shapeshift into other animal forms. He can shape change into a bear or a jungle cat. And when he's in these other forms, he actually gets entirely new abilities to those shapeshifted forms. And he'll almost play like an entirely different class. The warrior in a lot of other RPGs and morgues is one of the least interesting classes. 
the warrior traditionally doesn't really have mana or magic or anything of that nature to to lend itself to more interesting gameplay dynamics. So we came up with the idea of, of rage. And instead of having rage work exactly like mana where it starts at 100%, we decided to have it always start at zero. A, a warrior would start a combat not very angry, and, and as he takes damage and as he delivers damage to his foe, his rage bar would fill up, and then the warrior would be able to use his rage to execute his special abilities. With the rogue, we had a very similar sort of struggle, trying to come up with things that made him feel different. In his case, we gave him energy, which would work a lot like mana, but would very quickly be used up, but it would regenerate really fast. So you'd kind of be using it constantly to do some of your special abilities. As you're attacking an opponent and you execute abilities on them, you build up combo points. And the combo points can be seen in the user interface on any particular creature. And once you have at least one combo point on the creature, you can try to execute a finishing move. So that was a way to really make the rogue play very differently from the warrior, where a lot of traditional morgues, they're very similar classes with just a few different special abilities. And that's really been the approach we've tried to take with all the classes. I think one thing that defines uh, players in the world of Warcraft is actually the vast spells and abilities that each of the classes gets. A player can be very basic and new to the genre, and still be successful and go out, level up, and have a good time. Advanced players or more skilled players have a whole host of abilities to choose from, and I think people can really shine and show their skill off through all of the abilities, and it makes uh, both PvP and PvE environments a lot more exciting. We felt that player versus player combat was very important to bring to WoW. Each player depending on which race they choose, is put on a side. They either will be playing for the Alliance, which is composed of the humans, the dwarves, the gnomes, and the night elves, or they can choose a race that's on the Horde, which is composed of the orcs, trolls, taurins, and the undead. By choosing your race, you are choosing a side, which determines when you do engage in PvP, who are your friends and who are your foes. We felt like having a team-based PvP system was a lot more interesting than everyone kind of being out for themselves. One of the best parts about PvP is it gives you the chance to pit yourself against other players. They're really unpredictable and the skill levels span the whole spectrum. So PvP kind of gives everybody a chance to show what they've got. It also is a great way when you're sort of done engaging in your normal activities for the night. You've you've been leveling up and doing quests and you want to really like engage in the world of Warcraft. You want to defend your town or you want to go raid another alliance's town. It gives you that feeling that the world is real and solid and that you have a purpose in it. One of the challenges of developing a massively multiplayer RPG is how do you get people to start grouping in the game? How do you get people to really take part in the community? Well, the tact we took for this was to try to make sure that players could always solo in the game. They could always advance by just playing by themselves. But really try to make sure that there's plenty areas of the game that only can be done when you group up with other players. And we did a lot of different design decisions along the way to try to embrace the philosophy of allowing solo advancement while still encouraging grouping. There's a lot of cool quests that are more stealth oriented and those would be definitely tailored more towards the solo player so they can deliver items around the world, sneak around, and feel like they're accomplishing things on their own. Another very important element is the concept of crafting or trade skills. Our approach to trade skills was twofold. We have the concept of a gathering skill and we have the concept of a crafting skill. Gathering skills, they allow us to make the world much more dynamic. We can have herbs that just spawn throughout the world that if you have the herbalism gathering skill that you can go around, find these herbs, and then selling them or you could use them yourself. We also have mining in the game which miners would go around with their picks and find veins of ore, silver, or other types of uh, minerals. And it really allows the world to feel much more interesting. It's not just this world that has a bunch of creatures and pretty scenery. There's all these objects throughout the world that people can gather up and use in the trade skilling system. With the crafting skills, we want to try to make 
the making of the items really fun, not just something you go and buy the ingredients from a bunch of vendors and then make something. We wanted to make collecting the elements part of the game itself. We also try to make sure that the ingredients for the recipes to make trade skills are on creatures in the world or they're in other dangerous places. We really feel like it's a much friendlier system and it really allows anyone to become a trade skiller and have fun with it. We've talked about there being the mining gathering skill and the herbalism gathering skill and those feed into blacksmithing, engineering, and alchemy respectively. Then there are also just trade skills themselves that are very different. A miner might supply ore to a blacksmith who's going to bang that ore into shape and make swords, make shields, make armor, that sort of thing. But a miner could also supply an engineer. An engineer can make all sorts of cool mechanical items like a mechanical dragonling and can make bombs and dynamite, target dummies. And then there's also some trade skills that are almost like a mini game in and of themselves, such as fishing. Fishing is just a, a great activity. Anytime you're near a body of water, you can throw your line out, you watch your little bobber, and as soon as you see that bobber go down into the water and take a bite, you can pull it up and, and see what you get. So fishing kind of works very differently from, let's say, tailoring or leather working, but also falls within the trade skill system and is very fun and unique. Another one of the core tenets about World of Warcraft when it comes to what we might refer to as our elder game or end game is that while we really are trying to do a really interesting and deep raid game for guilds that want to take on dragons and these powerful creatures, we didn't want our elder game to only be about raid content. We also are trying to provide high end game PvP content for players and we also wanted to have our world have a sense of community and, and have some dynamic things that change throughout the world. In the raid game, a lot of these creatures, as you progress through them, will not even be available when, when the game first goes live. Like one example that we've talked about is the concept of Outland, which we introduced in Warcraft 3. And Outland is this area that actually is on another kind of uh, planet that is beyond the Dark Portal. And the Dark Portal has been closed for many years. Players on each of the different realms will have to find out how to open the Dark Portal again. And only once the players of each of these realms open that Dark Portal will people be able to go through it and find all the uber-creatures beyond that. 